Welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series, your resource for the latest news and updates on pressing issues facing the accounting profession. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Thursday, September 22nd edition of the AICPA Town Hall. Uh, my name is Michael Cerami, and I'll be your host for today's event. Uh, again, I'd like to welcome you and uh, looking forward to, to jumping in. We've got a very full agenda and lineup today. So let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> so just a real quick look at, uh, at our speaker lineup today. We have, uh, in order of appearance, we'll have Mark Peterson joining me from our DC office. Mark's got a lot to share with us. Um, next up, we'll have uh, Lisa Simpson. Lisa's gonna share, as she typically does, a, uh, an overview of uh, some technical issues. Uh, joining us as a special guest today, we're very excited to have Nancy Giordano. Nancy is a noted author and futurist, and Nancy's going to talk a bit about transformation and strategy. Uh, and then in closing out, we're going to have Lisa and Di Krupika uh, join us for a discussion on digital assets and what's happening in that category. So uh, we got a, a full hour for you, and uh, let's go ahead and jump in. So, Mark, let's go ahead and bring you in real quick. Um, it's, uh, you know, Secretary Yellen made news last week. She made a visit to the uh, IRS field office in, in Maryland and uh, made some, you know, pretty big pronouncements. She was talking about uh, the 80 million in 80 billion in funding um, that uh, that's been approved. And uh, she spent a lot of time talking about how it was, you know, reassuring people that it was going to go against improving uh, taxpayer services. I, th I think she even threw out one example that um, she anticipates 85% of inquiries and calls into the, uh, the service center will get, uh, you know, handled and, and uh, received versus I think this year we're tracking at about 15%. So uh, I think we'll go ahead and jump in and, and pose the question to you. Is this, uh, you know, is this to be believed? Uh, what do we make of all of this? Good to be with you, Michael. Um, yeah, so uh, skeptical, promising, but a little skeptical. 15% uh, to 85% is quite a jump. Um, I also just want to remind everybody that the $8 billion that that was put into the, the IRA tax bill, um, most of that went to enforcement. The absolute vast majority of that money went to enforcement. So yes, it's going to the IRS. Yes, it's going to be there. It's going to be for hiring people, but it's very focused on enforcement. The reason for that was because that the that it was considered a re revenue raiser within the IRA bill. So in order to pay for the fix to the AC, ACA, the healthcare portions of it, and then the uh, the green environmental tax credits, they had a funding mechanisms, more funding for the IRS enforcement meant that they were gonna be making uh, revenue on that side. So they've, they've really got to focus on enforcement, which brings us to the concern about how will service change? I have to say, um, again, they're, they're trying, we're rooting for them. We have a partnership with them that's incredibly important. We want them to function. Uh, we disagree on things, that's fine, but we really have a great partnership in order to make our system work. Um, she has some issues, re regardless of if they have the funding and regardless of the focus on it, there is some realities. W was not included in the funding um, in, in the um, Inflation Reduction Act that recently passed was special hiring authority. So. There are requirements around hiring federal employees and, you know, some special hiring authority would have reduced some of those hurdles that was not included. So that creates barriers. Think about, you know, the recruiting, the screening and then the onboarding of people. So there are just some infrastructures there that they're going to have to deal with, Michael, um, that, that are going to be a challenge. There's also just the reality of finding people. Um, you know, we all know the, the, the firm's. Um, and practitioners that are on the town hall all know that one of the biggest challenges is finding talent right now. Uh, and so, you know, even with the funding and even with a process, they're still going to have to work through, you know, just finding the candidates. Um, having said all that, I will say the, the I think the good news of her appearance here is that this is the first time that the Secretary of Treasury, uh, Janet Yellen, has actually been at an IRS facility it is they're escalating the focus on the importance of the IRS 
and they are very focused on service. So again, you know, we're hearing a lot about goals. Uh, we you know we're very supportive of that, and we want to figure out how to be helpful. As a matter of fact, um, and we we very much appreciate the emphasis that's putting being put on this. The other thing I'll say that I think we're going to see play out over um, the next few months uh, and possibly in the next year is a reflection on that funding that is so focused on enforcement. We're already seeing members of Congress on the Republican side um, introducing bills. They're you know unlikely to pass in, in, in the, within the current environment, but uh, if passed, would actually set targets for service so funding for enforcement couldn't be released unless those targets for service were reached. And I think we'll also see a discussion about maybe reprogramming some of that money to take some of it out of, out of enforcement to put it into service, but then it does hit that revenue score I mentioned to you. So a lot to play out. We're going to be very engaged. Uh, and again, uh, we never stop uh, focusing on on service after the last couple very challenging tax seasons. That's great, Mark. Great summary. It sounds like cautiously optimistic, remain vigilant, and uh, we'll just kind of manage it as it comes. Absolutely. You know, may, Mark, maybe connected to that, particularly around uh, service, in, in order to do this, um, we need, uh, we do need funding. Uh, you know, ironically enough, it seems like every time this year we find ourselves, um, like this year, we're I think eight days from the end of the uh, from the new fiscal year, and we still don't have a funded budget. Um, and so it 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 and it seems like again, um, lots of posturing happening. The two different sides kind of go into their corners and making pretty big pronouncements. Um, and so you know maybe talk a little bit about uh, you know how that's going to play out. Should we be concerned that the budget gets funded? Clearly, if it does or doesn't, you know, what impact is that going to have on what you just talked about relating to the IRS? So, sure, it's that time of year. Uh, I, I unfortunately, the, you know, the last few cycles we've been having this conversation this time of year because we're coming up to the end of fiscal year, so September 30. Uh, the the process in Congress is supposed to be appropriations bills in the House and the Senate go to the subcommittee, full committee. They go to the House and Senate floor, and then they're conference together and then the, the government is funded. That system hasn't been working for several cycles now. So we get in this situation where we're about to go to a government shutdown because funding stops. So the way in order to fix that is, is with what's called a continuing resolution, which is basically just, um, we're gonna continue to fund the government until a certain point in time uh, at a certain level. It might be at current levels or it could be you know adding additional funding to that short-term spending measure. Uh, it's certainly not going through that whole appropriation process, but again, uh, it's the way Congress has been fun functioning. It's very, there's going to be a lot of drama around it. There always is. Is there a chance it could, sh the government could shut down, which has a huge impact on the IRS and treasury uh, and practitioners? Very small. N neither side going into election wants to shut down the government. Um, there will be posturing. Um, you know, some of the, again, drama I will, I would uh, categorize it as has been, you know, during that um, Inflation Reduction Act debate, we knew they had to hold all the votes. Democrats had to hold all the votes of that narrow majority they have in the Senate, which meant Senator Manchin from, from West Virginia, and I'm sure you're reading about this. And one of the things that he wanted was permitting reform uh, in order to help with things, you know, from an energy state like West Virginia. Um, but because of the rules of reconciliation in that bill, it couldn't be included. It could be included in this short-term funding bill. Um, now, the short-term funding bill needs 60 votes, so that means that there has to be bipartisan su support for it in the Senate. And what we're seeing is there's opposition from Republicans uh, to the permitting reforms, and then there is a large group of House Democrats that have said that they would oppose it as well. And so... There were commitments made to the senator that it was going to move forward. Uh, you know, it can be put up for a vote, but the votes have to be there. They can't be guaranteed. Again, that's going to play out. It's getting a lot of press. Um, the White House has their initiatives they want attached to this. Um, money for Ukraine, uh, more money for COVID relief, R&D uh, for vaccinations, um, you know, home tests, things like that. Money for monkeypox. Uh, response and then natural disasters. We almost always see some natural disasters because the time of year included in these continuing resolutions. 
um, when you think about, you know, Kentucky and what's going on in Florida and California with the, with the wildfires. Um, I think it's pretty likely that, that, the, that the natural disaster funding will be included. And I think money for Ukraine has got a pretty good chance. I think the more funding for response to COVID, a little less likely, big debate over, over whether it's necessary or not. Monkeypox is kind of in the same boat. Does it all happen? I think in some way, shape, or form, it, it really does. The other pushback is, is about kind of the structure of the short-term funding. And this has happened before. Do you take it just past um, the shutdown and before the election? Do you take it past the election or do you take it into next year? Uh, the way this is probably going to play out is we get into the middle of December. So it would the can would get kicked past the election. So then you go into lame duck. And then there is some pushback against the short term concept of going past the election to December from some members on, on the conservative wing in the House to say, well, let's go to 2023. Uh, part of that is betting. They're betting that they're, they're going to be a majority because of their outlook on the election, at least in the House of Representatives. If I had to put odds on, odds on it, I think it's after the election, mid-December, which puts in play one more opportunity, I think, Michael, um, which is this idea of, of a year-end deal, kind of the last legislative vehicle leaving the station. That's great, Mark. And just maybe elaborate a little bit. So it sounds like there could be some things left on the on the cutting room floor. Um, and and if so, maybe tie it to to why it matters to folks on on this uh, this call. So I mean, basically, the way things have worked lately is that there are very few actual vehicles that make it through both bodies into the the, the president, and usually they're the big ones. So um, that's where we are right now. We've got a burning platform with a potential government shutdown. So there's going to be this continuing resolution that gets us to middle of December and it'll have some funding and some issues tied to it. Everybody's going to want to get on that train. So in the middle of December, they're going to have another opportunity to, to potentially put together a year end deal. Uh, there will be a lot of interest in, in being included in that. And there are actually some very interesting bipartisan uh, initiatives that could be included. One which we're going to watch closely is some retirement, uh, significant retirement um, initiative that will create opportunities for for planning for practitioners and town hall members. They're going to another one that's going to be important to us is dealing with expiring tax provisions. So that could be included. Um, and there are other cats and dogs that will definitely be lined up to be included in that vehicle because it'll be the last one out. Having said that, it's also lame duck session, which means you have members that are waiting until next Congress when they might be in charge. You've got some members that retired and you got some members that lost their elections. And so the dynamics about getting the votes and what's included and what's not um, are way more than the policy. But there is going to be another opportunity for things like addressing that um, special hiring authority for the IRS. Great, Mark. So the recap quickly, it sounds like cautiously optimistic on the IRS, um, optimistic that funding will in, in fact move forward. And it, it sounds like October 6th, which is the next uh, town hall, we'll have you back to maybe give some more details on how continuing resolution is tracking. Um, make sense? Yeah, absolutely. We're going to have we're going to have lots of stuff to talk about this fall. Great. And Mark, I, I will I will tell you, I'm, I'm giving you the Pulse of the People Award. The first question submitted even before we started rolling today in the Q&A was, what's up with Yellen and, and, the, and the, the speech she gave last week? And that's what you started us off with. So thank you for that. And we'll have you back a little bit later on in, uh, in, in the open forum to, to talk a little bit more. So thank you, Mark. Great update. You um, so let, let, let's go ahead and pivot to, uh, to some of these ongoing uh, pressing technical issues. We'll bring in uh, Lisa Simpson. Uh, Lisa needs no introduction. Hey, Lisa, welcome. And you're coming to us live from our studio down there in uh, in Durham, North Carolina. Absolutely. I've been in the Durham office the last few days um, helping with a bunch of volunteers. I'm planning the 2023 Engage Conference, and I'm excited to get to be part of the, the first town hall from our new Durham studio. So That's awesome, Lisa. Happy. Welcome. And I'll go ahead and let you dig in on the technical issues. All right. So I wanted to give you some updates on some things that Ed, Carl, and I talked to you about a couple of weeks ago in the town hall. Busy slide. I'm just going to focus your attention on a couple of things. But two weeks ago, uh, Ed and I went into a pretty in-depth conversation about some of our advocacy requests relating to tax issues 
So you can go back and watch that town hall on September 8th if you didn't catch it live. But uh, as soon as that town hall was over, we actually submitted another advocacy letter. And this one was ex urging the IRS to expand that relief around notice 2022-36 that waived um, filing deadline penalties for certain returns. We've asked that additional returns be added to that expanded relief. And those are um, some of the ones you'll be familiar with are 706 for estate tax and, and generation skipping transfer tax, and then um, 990s for nonprofit organizations. There's a longer list and you'll find all of the items that we've asked for in the letter that is hyperlinked in your slides that you can download from the materials. Um, we also asked that the IRS notify borrowers who are eligible for that ex expanded relief that that will be provided to them. You will note that we asked for that penalty relief deadline to be extended to December 31 instead of the IRS's date of, of September 30. So it's September 22nd, September 30 is just around the corner. Uh, we're not optimistic that we're gonna get that extended deadline, but we are continuing to advocate for it. Another item that came in this week related to tax is um, kind of an interesting memo from the IRS um, Office of Chief Counsel. We'll be giving you a link to it. And then just yesterday, an IRS notice came out about it. Lots of words on the slides again, because I, I wanna make sure that you have the full context. But if we just summarize it, basically the issue at hand is whether or not a PPP borrower who got improper forgiveness of their loan will have to report that improper forgiveness on their tax return. The um, advice from the chief counsel memo is that the answer is yes. If a taxpayer fraudulently received PPP forgiveness, then that taxpayer is required to include loan forgiveness income as gross income. Uh, really interesting memo. It says this advice may not be used or cited as precedent, but it does kind of give us some insight onto the IRS position. Interesting fact, if you um, have five extra minutes and you wanna get a refresher on, on how different um, tax authority levels are determined, we've given you a link to a resource that we have there. We don't know what's gonna come of this, but we do, just as a reminder, um, the statute of limitations for fraud on PPP loans was recently extended to 10 years. That could be what this is about. So we're, we're keeping our eye on it. Um, ERC, who doesn't want to talk about ERC on a regular basis? So we continue to hear from you that your clients are being inundated with ads from aggressive ERC mills. And we're trying to continue to raise awareness with the IRS. They are hearing from us about it on a regular basis. We, there, are, there are news stories out there that perhaps the IRS is um, diverting some resources so that ERC claims can be audited more aggressively. We have not had direct confirmation from the IRS on that. What we are hearing from you and from others is that um, the IRS started out in late spring, early summer with some general um, requests for additional information around some ERC claims that have been filed. Then there was a lull. And now what we're hearing is that the um, requests are more in depth. And we're also hearing that some of the questions are basically, show me where you have a shutdown order that impacted your operation and that, that now results in this ERC claim being valid. So as we said a couple of weeks ago, we certainly expect to see the IRS be pretty vigorous in auditing ERC claims. They are slowing down, according to what we're hearing from, from you, they are slowing down processing of some of those larger ERC refund claims because they wanna take a look at them before they actually fund the refund back to the taxpayer. So again, we'll keep you informed as we hear anything in the meantime, a couple of things that we wanted to let you know about. There is a podcast that Chris Esposito and April Walker just released. If it's not live at right now, it'll be live any, any minute now. 
and it's kind of going through the current status of ERC, what's reality, what's myth. And also to that point, we are developing a ERC fact versus fiction uh, resource that you'll be able to give to your clients. And we will um, include links to that as soon as it's available on the site. So thank you all for letting us know what you're hearing in the marketplace. It's really insightful for us and, and we use it to continue to advocate with the IRS. Um, for some good news, uh, a couple of months ago, we fielded a PCPS CPA firm top issues survey and you all responded. We, we appreciate that. So I wanted to point you to some follow-up items around that. The commentary and analysis is available on the site. It's really interesting and it digs into um, firm size issues and um, some of the trends that we've seen over time. But what's also interesting is that we've created a roadmap for you to help you easily navigate to some of the, the top challenges that you identified. So I wanted to make sure you had that link and um, you'll be able to hopefully use that to help tackle some of those top challenges. Great, thank you, Lisa. And that survey is a, it's a great uh, temperature check on all that's going on with firms of uh, all sizes. So thanks for sharing that. And we'll look to bring you back in just a few minutes. Thanks. <clears throat> so let's, let's go ahead and switch gears a little bit and, and zoom out uh, from uh, some of the, the technical issues uh, that are you know, a little bit more detailed. And we wanted, to, we wanted to bring in our next guest, Nancy Giordano. Um, hi, Nancy. Hey, how are you? Good. Nancy, it's great to have you with us here today. Nancy is someone who will be joining us in December at Digital CPA for our annual uh, annual conference. She'll be doing one of the keynotes. Uh, you know, Nancy's someone we follow closely. She's both a noted author, best-selling author and futurist. And a lot of what Nancy researches and studies is around uh, you know, transformation and strategy, particularly, uh, you know, in, uh, in changing environments. And it's probably an understatement to say we're in a fairly changing environment. Uh, so Nancy, welcome. And we, we look forward to chatting with you here a little bit. So, you know, let's go ahead and, and jump in, Nancy. I, I, you know, I think um, having, you know, read through some of your research and just in hearing you, you talk previously, um, I know you've put a lot of focus into this kind of shift that's occurring in the broader marketplace, uh, you know, kind of the future of work and, you know, more specifically how organizations are going to need to to change and adapt. And this concept of that we're currently living through a third industrial revolution, um, but instead of what I think people maybe, you know, agree with so much call a, a fourth industrial revolution, uh, it's a little bit more of a of a exponential uh, revolution. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that uh, for us today. Great. Yeah, yeah. I just think that we're in a much more dramatic time. And when we start to use language that is still from the industrial era, it makes it sound like we're going to ease our way into uh, uh, how things are changing. And I think, again, it's going to happen much more quickly. And partly it is the power of the technologies, right? Artificial intelligence and 3D printing and CRISPR bioengineering and all those things that are advancing and converging, but it really is the convergence. It's the fact that you've got all of these things happening at the same time. And we're also hopefully having an awakening around various things as a society. So the, any of the industrial revolutions had impact on how we work and how we live and where we live and what the laws and regulations were in order to keep us safe in those transitions. But I think it's going to become much more dramatic now. And so I'm encouraging us to think about it much more as an exponential productivity revolution than just another industrial one, which has really requires different way of thinking, different way of approaching, different way of uh, navigating it all together. Um, but the reason I've named it that, and we could have a long debate about how to appropriately name it, but it is exponential in the fact that it will leap very, very quickly. And we can talk about a couple of examples of that. Um, and I do think we'll be able to do more with less. So I think this whole conversation about productivity is a, a loaded word, I'm sure. Um, and we can define it different ways, but I think of it that we'll be able to create more, hopefully with less uh, in terms of footprint on our planet and with time and energy, and that will free us up to do other things and hopefully solve problems in a more interesting way. So I just think that there's a, a really exciting moment. But when you talk to the people who are building the future, and I'll talk about this when y'all come to Austin in December. Um, but the people who are actively building it and ask them how far along we are, it's like 1%. 
And depending on the technology or the application, it's probably less than that or a little bit more than that, but it's, it's really early days. So imagine standing on the front end of a big revolution, right? Whether it was the Enlightenment or, you know, where it was, uh, did you know that you were here? And I think that we are there. That's great, Nancy. And it makes a ton of sense, you know, particularly as I think um, to a lot of folks dialed in into this call, uh, both, uh, you know, members in industry or in firms large and small. Uh, and you and I have talked about this offline. Again, um, you know, capacity, talent, uh, no different than than other uh, under in other industries or professions is figuring out how to kind of embrace concepts like technology uh, to improve on that capacity. Um, and I know you talk a lot about AI enabled organizations uh, and, and maybe, you know, how, you know, that just what digital transformation really will mean. Uh, maybe elaborate on that a little bit here today. Well, you know, again, I have the privilege of talking to people across all these different technologies, but the one that I have decided I personally want to focus more on and I invest more of my time on is artificial intelligence or machine learning or however you want to define uh, this arena. And I helped start a company many, many years ago in this uh, space. I just want to players, uh, a group of people. Um, and now I'm a, a consultant or an advisor to a more pragmatic one called Kung Fu AI. And so we spend a lot of time discerning between the strategic side of it, the actual building of the algorithm side of it, and then what does it mean inside an organization? And what you find is that third bucket is really important, that there's a lot of education, a lot of communication that needs to happen in order for those tools to be really effective inside. You can build all kinds of things, but if people are scared of them or don't understand them or don't uh, have faith in them, then they really you know, it's a lot of work that went nowhere. So I think we spend a lot of time thinking about not how you just go from being like AI curious or even AI enabled, but AI first, AI led. You know, there's a thinking that if you in the next few years don't become uh, much more uh, facile with this, you'll either be you know out of business or owned by somebody who is AI first in this. Because again, it just has such huge productivity gains and you're able to take this amount of information, analyze it uh, in more thoughtful ways, being able to uh, see the patterns across uh, complexity. And one of the things I think the biggest gift of AI is that it's able to hopefully unweave some of the complexity and maybe we'll see the interdependencies of this. You know, the clearest example I can give is actually in bioscience right now, but this whole conversation about proteins and how proteins are made up has been always a big mystery about how we can actually sort of work backwards on the, the protein equation. And in 2018, a company called AlphaFold, or I guess a technology called AlphaFold out of DeepMind, was able to construct the first uh, decoding of a protein. That was one, and that was a huge breakthrough. And then by 2022, this past this year, they've now decided that they've decoded the 200 million, I think it is, proteins that exist that make up all of our planet. That's really fast. Yeah, that's the answer. Right, from having a 50-year problem being that, you know, impossible to solve to now being completely decoded. And that's the kind of productivity leap that AI allows us to do. Uh, so the question is, what does that mean for accounting? What does that mean for uh, business, I think we'll just be looking at data a lot more thoughtfully. You know, I was reminded of a um, an app that won a World Economic Forum like top 100 companies to look for a few years ago called Clarity AI. Um, and I just reviewed it again before we jumped on this call. And it's really a tool to decide to help organizations across all different spectrums of investment and tracking uh, better understand their sustainability progress and goals. And part of what makes them so successful is they can look at vast amounts of data, like two to three times more than any other measurement tool has been able to do. So that's the power of it. Uh, and kind of building on that, I totally agree with you. I mean, the access to data is going to, is just going to increase exponentially, but, but the key would, I think, be how do you, how do you put that data to use? Yeah. Um, What's your perspective on that? That seems like a bit, pretty big piece of the, the equation. Yeah, and I think that we're all building more understanding and literacy around that, right? A whole portion of the practice for Kung Fu AI is around the strategic side of it. Like strategically, what are we trying to accomplish? And as such, where do we get the data? And then that whole portion about how you get the data, how you label the data, how you uh, prioritize the data, how you ensure the data isn't biased uh, is a really key part. So I think we're all learning how to do this more effectively. Uh, I get excited about that there are various organizations that are there to try and coach us. One is called the uh, Responsible AI Institute that is helping build a framing for this kind of thing. So we start to build algorithms. We think about how we're doing so across a range of criteria so that we are doing them thoughtfully and safely. So there's, again, strategically, what does it mean inside my organization? There's the how do I build it thoughtfully and responsibly? And then how do I transfer it into an organization so that people don't feel threatened by it and believe and trust its recommendations? Because at some point, it's going to go from just being... You know, predictive to being actually prescriptive 
and we have to think about does that feel good or does that feel good around it? How do we trust it? How do we you know, um, push against it if we feel as though, I mean, I already get frustrated with my credit score and I'm trying to figure out how that ever happened um, or, or an insurance you know, adjustment about whether or not I'm a good driver or not a good driver. So imagine this on steroids around so much of our environment. We have to be able to build systems around it that hold it well. That's right. That the wonderful black box known as the credit score. <laughs> uh, Nancy, maybe a closing closing comment and and, and ask for your perspective. Is so every uh, you know obviously as we move into this this uh, fourth phase um, and you know no professions maybe maybe grappling with it more than the accounting profession is just you know the reskilling the upskilling uh, of people. Um, thoughts on that. Well, I think it's a really huge uh, opportunity. And I know we had a couple of slides. I'm not sure if it makes sense to pull any of them up at this moment. Michael, use your discretion sure. on that, right? This was the, the, the leap that just was trying to say we're moving into a new way of thinking. But if you think about, I mean, I've used this for years, but this idea that old economy expectations have definitely shifted to this new way of thinking. And then what's exciting for me is that if we can put the humans at the center of this decision making, it isn't so scary. And we actually make really, really good decisions that we'll be proud of for the decades to come. So we're not just making short-term decisions right now. We're actually going to invest in things and build things that are going to have lots of long-term implications. So things like, again, that we're, we're always were focused on certainty. Now we're going to focus on much more about how we handle dynamic information and change. So this whole idea about things surging and then you know, reducing, it's a, it's a much more volatile environment for supply chain and everything else, um, which allows us, again, then to need to be more, we've used these words, right? Adaptive, distributed, collaborative to move from this idea of authority, like I'm definitely the person who knows everything, to really understanding what your beliefs are that are guiding this and that are aligning all of your strategies against, because there's no one who's going to know for sure, but we do trust that you're coming at it with the right intent. Um, we've talked a lot about moving from shareholders to stakeholders and what that means. Um, it's interesting when we think about this idea of consistency, right? We were always trying to figure out how to be consistent, build brands that were perfectly uh, scalable around the world. And now we're really thinking about how do we build things that are responsive so that in the local terrain or in the local environment, we're really serving the needs much more thoughtfully and much more customized, if you will, uh, with much more context around all those things. So if you start to imagine that we're moving from this idea of this, it's just a, a, a predictable, re replicable, if you will, transaction that we try and get just more and more perfect and more and more efficient with each time to really that we're building things with much more thoughtfulness in terms of the relationship um, and much more context and much more empathy uh, built inside that. And there's a whole mindset shift that goes with that that I talk about in this book that I researched and wrote uh, and released, I think a year and a half ago or so, but there is a really, we have to think differently as we head into this exponential productivity revolution in order to be able to uh, reap its benefits and again, ensure that we're building things that we're proud of long-term. Nancy, that's great. A lot, lot to think about. I know um, you're gonna get into this in much more detail at our December conference, uh, Digital CPA in, in Austin. And as you just mentioned, it, we don't have a slide here, but we did insert a slide uh, that will be in the in the final copy of, uh, of today's um, presentation that talks about your new book out called Leadering. And so a lot of these concepts, you go into great detail. Uh, and so just wanna give a call out to that. So thank you, Nancy, thanks for being with us. Look forward to seeing you in a few months. I do too. And I think there's a discount we included in that as well in case people want to, you know, uh, save a little money as they go look at this new future and think a lot about how we prepare better for all that's coming toward us and make really, really good decisions. I'm excited to see you guys in a few months. Awesome. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Take good care. All right. So moving right along, let's, uh, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into one of the emerging technology areas. Uh, we're going to have a digital assets overview. So I want to invite Lisa Simpson back with us and also bring back in uh, Dai Krupika, who is on our emerging uh, assurance and advisory team here at AICPA. So Lisa, Dai, well, a lot, lot going on in this category right now. And I know the two of you are going to go ahead and help us make sense of it all. And that having Nancy as the, the lead in was perfect because so much of of what she talked about was emerging technology and, and where the future is going. So that's a, a perfect setup for my conversation with Di. Thanks for joining us. Um, for those of you who haven't met Di, she's been with the AICPA for about 12 years. She's the lead manager and her main focus is around digital assets. So I'm excited that you're here to join us. I wanted to kind of give you a landscape of what I wanna talk with Di about. And you might be asking why, why are we gonna talk about digital assets right now? 
So from my perspective, as I was thinking about what are the kinds of conversations you're going to be talking with your clients about as you go into whether it's audit prep calls or talking to clients about upcoming tax issues that maybe you don't quite know they've gotten into a digital asset area. Uh, I thought we should just level set. What is a digital asset? What are some of the challenges that you're going to encounter as you're talking to your clients about it or that your clients may be thinking about? Di's going to give us a look at the ecosystem. We're going to talk about some trends in the space and then some of the things that the association is doing around digital assets and most importantly, some of the resources that you have available. So Di, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. And if nothing else com comes out of this conversation, at least I'll be a little cooler when I'm talking to my kids because I'll know more about what a digital asset really is. Excellent. I'm so excited to be here to talk to you about my most passionate project. At the AICPA, I work on a whole bunch of emerging technology areas such as artificial intelligence, robotics process automation, but my main project is digital assets. And I love it because it is constantly changing there is new digital assets and digital asset uses that are being created on a continual basis. And you basically wake up in the morning saying, what is going to happen with this space? There's some brilliant minds out there. So taking a step back and talking about, okay, what is a digital asset? And I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of people saying, well, isn't a, a digital asset just an asset that's digital? So a picture or a music file? And yeah, that is a digital asset, but in the context and the scope that we're talking about, a digital asset has three main components, and I'll go through those right now so that you understand what the scope is we're talking about. So the first component is that this digital asset is a, it's a digital record made using cryptography and cryptography is used for verification and security purposes. So Cryptography is just that fancy word of saying, okay, this data is secure. And that's extremely important, obviously, in the digital world. So that is the first component of it. And then we move on to, okay, it has a second component where it uses what's called distributed ledger technology. And a type of distributed ledger technology is what's called a blockchain. There's many different types of digital ledgers. Um, blockchain is just happens to be one of them. And in if you take a step back from what it is, if you take a look at a ledger itself, it's not just one person looking at a ledger, seeing the changes. If you have 10 participants, they all have access to this ledger at the same time, kind of similar to say a team's shared document where people are making changes and you're seeing it in real time, basically being updated. So distributed ledger, many different types, blockchain is one of them. And if you drill down farther, there's many different types of blockchain, but that is for another day, definitely, because that's a whole nother conversation. So that is the second component of what a digital asset is. And the third piece of it is that, and the most fascinating piece of it is the fact that it has the ability to be used for so many different things. For example, it could be a medium of exchange. You can use it to purchase things. You can use it when uh, buying something. Um, I mean, when selling something and getting paid for it. It's also a financing vehicle. I could loan out Bitcoin and get Bitcoin back. So there's a whole bunch of different uses in it. And I think the key takeaway here is that digital assets is the term we use for the entire asset class. And there are different types of digital assets out there, but this is the asset class, the umbrella, the term that's used for the umbrella. So let's drill in a little more on, um, we'll get into some of the uses, but, but first for, for a layman like me, what are some of the challenges that I would encounter if I had a client who had invested in Bitcoin or, or who told me that they were now staking or mining? Tell me more. So I think, I think that ultimately any new area, especially an emerging area that anybody is going to go ahead and get into, it is the terminology. It's the vocabulary. 
And when you go ahead and trying to figure out, okay, you know what a digital asset is now, it has those three components. This listing here, which I won't go through every single one of them, but this listing is the type of digital assets that can be. So the first one will take crypto asset. That's that medium of exchange. It's the Bitcoin or it's ether where you can actually use it to purchase things or send, send value to somebody else. And I put virtual currencies in here as well, because the, in the IRS world, they use virtual currencies for a crypto asset. But of course, to add to the confusion and the challenges is that the IRS might use, and there's an actual comment letter, I think it went out in August, they use virtual currencies in two different ways, potentially to you to mean crypto asset, or they've used it to mean that digital asset, which is that asset class. So within the regulators, they use different terms. So then, and different regulators use different terms. So it gets a little bit confusing here. Um, there is also what's called asset backed tokens. And this is where they are, because of the volatility of a crypto asset, like a Bitcoin, basically they've created tokens that are backed or linked to certain assets. And there are different types of them. One is like a fiat backed token. And that would be linked to, for example, a US dollar. So it would, it would basically stay at the value of that US dollar. And there's crypto backed tokens, there's commodity, gold happens to be the, the one. So the, that token is going to follow the value of what's backing it. Uh, so ultimately here, I think the key takeaway is you're gonna hear a lot of terms. You need to learn these terms in order to be able to have conversations with potentially your clients who are getting involved with this. And don't go based on the term, uh, the term that's being used, because you need to really be looking at the form, the underlying rights and obligations of this asset, so you know what you're dealing with. And that's really what is super important in this space. Know what type of asset it is, so you know what accounting there is for it, and ultimately that might have tax implications. Okay, great. All right. So there, you'd mentioned that there are lots of ways to use digital assets. I'm going to ask you just a couple. Um, how about the, what the cool kids call DeFi? What's decentralized finance? So decentralized finance, if you think about it, it in the centralized, in the, the regular world, I'm going to call it, anything that is um, you can think about, like loan, for example. But now you take it to a decentralized position and you're talking about removing the intermediary you're removing the bank so or whatever institution is involved so now i am loaning lisa 10 bitcoin without an intermediary it is just going straight to her wallet instead of going through a third party so if you can think about all the different ways that the centralized finance <laughs> Um, activity happens. This is just removing that intermediary. But there'll still be interest. I would pay back in Bitcoin or I could pay back in any method that... There's different ways that it can be set up, but okay. the key point is that it doesn't go through that intermediary. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, so lots of other uses, but I, let's go ahead and start talking about who all of the, the players are that you, again, if you're talking to a client and they say, yeah, I took up um, staking this year, uh, no tax implications, no audit implications. You want to know what does staking mean? So what are some of the most common elements of the ecosystem? So that's where it really getting yourself familiar with the ecosystem and know that your clients or the individuals that you're dealing with won't be just entering this space from one angle. You can have a client that's holding uh, an entity that holds digital assets. You can have a custodian who is now holding digital assets on behalf of others. You can have an entity that's an exchange or there's a whole bunch of vendors now that are accepting digital assets as well. And the mining and staking piece of it is that if you're 
client or entity is going to go ahead and get involved in the validation process, which is more technical, but there's a validation process that goes into making sure that these digital records are recorded and they're valid and you can get paid for that. So there's a different revenue stream um, that these individuals can get depending on what type of entity they are. And basically it's the key takeaway here is look out for the various sources that are not just gonna be coming from one source. There's potential tax implications as well when you're, really, when you're dealing with a whole bunch of different revenue sources. So before we uh, talk about the trends, I do just wanna level set. This is not gonna be our, our only conversation about digital assets. As you can tell, there is a lot to take in. And um, so we'll, we'll keep this on your radar. So if your mind is blown right now, that's okay. Yeah, uh, we're gonna come back and again, we'll, we'll point you to those resources. So um, with the, the trends, I know that there is a lot of, um, let's say some skepticism in the market about, is, is this a passing fad? Is it gonna stay around forever? Or is this just a, um, a Ponzi scheme. And we we know that there are um, lots of volatility in the market. So from your perspective, why should we be talking about digital assets? So we obviously cannot predict the future. We've been involved and I've been involved since 2018 developing content. I work with about 30 plus subject matter experts in the field developing accounting and auditing guidance related to this. And I work with this every single day. And I know that I can't predict the future, we can't predict the future, but we look at the facts that are coming out. And that's how we know that we need to get ahead of this. And you don't need the information once it's hit all of the, your clients, you need it beforehand to start having these conversations with clients and knowing just ultimately what to be looking for and when your client comes to you, know that it's going ahead and um, being able to just be prepared for those conversations. So if you look at the broader picture here, we're talking about, I, I mentioned two crypto assets, Bitcoin and Ether. There are over 20,000 crypto assets out there right now. And this is why it's so important too, to know what asset you're dealing with. Is it a Lisa coin? Is it a Dai coin? Or is it a Bitcoin? Big difference there. Then you look at the number of exchanges. A year ago, there's only about 300 exchanges. Now it's double at 600. And we're not talking about small dollars here. As of June, and these numbers have totally changed probably because of the volatility, but we're talking about trillions of dollars in the market cap. So we, it's not a small amount of money. And so it is extremely important to a lot of people um, and the other thing that we can take a look at is, okay, what about the regulators? What are they doing? FASB just picked up a project. They're working on crypto assets and trying to scope it out currently. The SEC just announced in the last couple of weeks, they're creating a crypto division. There's a ton of legislative activity and part of my working group activity and responsibility is to take a look at those legislative activities and make sure that we are on point and we know what's coming down the pipeline so we know what resources you all need and then 48 hours ago nasdaq just said that they are going to build out a crypto exchange these are huge huge trends and we are keeping our eye on them so that everybody is has the resources that they need so, Di, as we um, move to the um, some of the activities, a questions come in about can you can you explain what staking is? And I know that was one that I had asked you about. Um, so, so layman's terms. Layman's terms, really simple. You are you have your token, you pledge your token, and you lock it up. You can't use it, but it's used in the validation process to validate those transactions that are being recorded on the blockchain. And for that you get paid. That's kind of the simplest way I could describe it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk about uh, some of the, just really quickly, what are some of the activities that we have across the association? I know we have tax, 
and, and some other great Yes, yeah, so Virtual Currency Tax Force, lots of activity, like I mentioned about the 1040 form and the, the instructions. There is a comment letter on that because we need clarity and we know what we need clarity on certain things. The Forensic and Litigation Services uh, Working Group is just starting up. We know, you look at the news, you see that there is a constant activity related to a news related to fraud in this area. It worries people. We know that there needs to be guidance in that area. And then the Digital Asset Working Group is my group. Uh, Proof of Reserve Working Group is a subset. It's on a type of digital asset specifically called a stable coin, uh, which is that fiat backed to that dollar. Um, and there's a lot of activity, a lot of resources. Like I said, we have almost a hundred pages of content on accounting and auditing guidance specific for digital assets. Now we are continually talking about topics, adding to that practice aid. So next year we will go ahead and um, actually not even next year, uh, this year and into next year, we will be continually increasing the amount of content and guidance based on what is the most um, the most pressing items that we know are out there. And there's a ton of other resources we have for everybody who is getting involved in this space. And some of those we've included in your materials today, so you can download the glossary um, and also the accounting and for and auditing of digital assets practice aid. So you've got some, some great resources that we've uploaded to the site for you today and then links to the others. Um, we've got a blockchain symposium report that'll be coming out soon. We will continue to um, monitor all of the developments in this really interesting and um, hard to wrap your mind around kind of stuff. But uh, I want to uh, thank you so much for joining us today and, and giving us this overview. Again, not the last time we'll talk about digital assets, but thanks for giving us the, the first look at, at trying to understand it all. It's great to be here. <clears throat> Lisa Dye, that was uh, fantastic. It's a lot of information to fit into a short period of time. I think admittedly many of our attendees have their minds blown, um, but I think you did a, a fantastic job of you know, providing high level concepts and more importantly, pointing them to all the great resources that we're uh, churning out um, to help them make sense of this. This is a very fluid area, so we're staying on top of it and we'll continue to, to put out resources that help folks uh, make sense of it. Um, I also did want to just uh, highlight for folks that we, we do have a webinar coming up uh, next Wednesday, September 28th. We'll focus more exclusively on the tax side of crypto and how to support clients uh, you know, who have uh, digital assets uh, from a tax perspective. So. It's a free webinar. It's an hour. It's one o'clock Eastern time next Wednesday. If you want to go ahead and register, um, it, it'll be a, it'll have the opportunity to go into a lot more detail on what uh, some of the things that Di and Lisa touched on. So thank you both. So let's go ahead and, and bring up our, our team. Another great, uh, great job today. Lots of terrific content. Um, we only have time for one or two questions, but but um, Di, maybe we'll go right back to you real quick. I think there were just a lot of questions on the, the cost basis of digital assets. I don't know that we, we can go too deeply, but if there's any comments or references you want to make on it, um, now would be a good time. So in the digital asset practice aid, we have a whole section on um, the value, fair value, uh, questions. I think they're 16 through 21, and it goes into the cost basis and how the unit of account and how to go ahead and try to figure out, okay, what? how do you track that? And obviously, um, there's a lot of good resources in there for that. Great. And Michael, as, as an aside, um, we also have tax resources around digital assets. We'll put those resources links to those in the town hall newsletter so that you get those next week as well, because you've got the accounting and auditing and then you've got the tax implications. So we'll follow Great. up on in the town hall newsletter. And Lisa, let's come back to you switching gears real quickly. Just any any update on K2, K3? I mean, there's been some, some questions on that. Get any we are continuing to try to keep the communication channels open with the IRS on that and have a, a meeting scheduled, I believe it's in November, to continue to ask for some clarity, some relief, and uh, simplification of that process. That's great. A great question. Well, thank you all. Thank you for being here. Great job. Um, let's go ahead and, and jump into a, 
a few final closing slides here. Um, so just kind of summarize today, uh, again, you, you heard Mark uh, talk, give a great update on uh, what's happening in DC and with our DC team. Uh, you know, we remain cautiously optimistic that things will improve going into next year. Uh, you know, it will be a, an important, uh, you know, 90 days coming up uh, with the, you know, the government funding issue and just seeing uh, what happens with the, you know, kind of Congress funding the budget in the in the short term, um, hopefully avoiding any type of shutdown. And we'll have an update on the continuing resolution in our October 6th town hall and then more detail on the year end bill. Um, you know, again, I thought we had a great discussion here on digital transformation and just really understanding uh, how much work is changing and what is going to be required from all of us to kind of change along with it. Um, I know a little bit more theoretical and we continue to try to dig into taking the theoretical to the how, uh, particularly in the context of the accounting profession. Um, and then lastly, just a great discussion by Lisa and I on, on digital assets. You know, it's it's like it says in the bullet, you know, digital assets has its enthusiasts and it has its detractors. You know, people are very opposite ends. Uh, I think we just see our job as following it closely, uh, staying very well informed about it, as I think Di, uh, you know, demonstrated. Um, the use cases continue to emerge. So we just want to make sure that depending on, on whichever path uh, is followed that we're there and prepared to provide you with, uh, you know, information and content resources to help you kind of navigate it. Um, again, each one of these town halls is recorded. Uh, so all, all of our past town hall, halls can be accessed on our YouTube channel on the website. Actually, a link will also be sent out in the uh, post town hall uh, email. So please do look out for that in case you want to go back and, and revisit any of today's concepts. Um, I want to clarify one thing. I, I said the next town hall will be October 6th. That is a true statement. But we also have a special edition town hall uh, next Thursday uh, that's going to focus uh, exclusively on uh, technologies, more specifically accounting technology and its impact on you know changing business models, the accounting profession. So we're going to have a, a whole host of accounting technology company leaders uh, here in the studio with us talking with Eric Auskerson and Tom Hood and kind of unpacking how technology is impacting uh, the profession and uh, what you do, what you all of you do day to day. So it's really, uh, we're excited about it. It's essentially a tech summit. And then we'll resume again on, um, on October 6th with a more traditional town hall format. Um, I know Lisa always likes me to remind everyone that uh, we only we are only as good as the volunteers uh, that that step forward. Um, so please do uh, feel free to join the ranks of, of volunteers. Uh, applications are due by October 1st um, and want to just thank everybody once again. I uh, hope you enjoyed today's uh, edition of the ICPA Town Hall and we'll see you back here next Thursday uh, with our special edition Tech Summit. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. You can now subscribe to the AICPA Town Hall series on your favorite podcast platform, as well as watch archives on YouTube and AICPA TV. Tune in for live broadcasts Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time.